that passage in the chat just now. There's no one in charge. A while back I was reading someone talking about how one of the lessons of the European Enlightenment was just that there's no one in charge. And he interpreted his meaning as, we're free to do whatever we want. When it comes to the Dharma, we can design the Dharma any way we want. Nobody can say anything against it. As if our actions had no consequences. The basic principle of the Buddhist teachings is that our actions do have consequences, and there's no one out there to protect us from our actions. There's no one to save us, no one to wash our sins away. The world offers no shelter, so we have to provide shelter for ourselves. This is the principle behind restraint. The Buddha talks about restraint in two contexts. One is about restraint in the things you bring in to your mind, the things you look at, listen to, receive through all the senses. But you're not purely receiving. The mind goes out, and that's the other part where we have to exercise restraint, particularly in what we do and say and think. We like to think that by doing the meditation it will take care of everything. Our life will get better, and in some ways it does. But the training goes the other way as well, starting with simple things like what you say, what you do, what you allow yourself to say, what you don't allow yourself to say, and the same with your actions, the same with your thoughts. This will have an impact on your mind. As John Fuang said, if you can't control your mouth, there's no way you're going to control your mind. And it's a great way for learning about yourself, because we tend to act on impulse. We want to say something, it comes right out. And then we have to think about it later. And sometimes if we don't like what we did, we we'll refuse to think about it, and that way we don't learn. The Buddha talks about not neglecting discernment, and he means that all the time. An important part of discernment is seeing the connections between things. As a John Lee once said, if you see causes without their results, that's not discernment. See results without their causes, that's not discernment either. You have to see the connection. So you have to stop and think before you say something, what's the result going to be? If you expect any harm at all, no matter how much you may want to say it, or how much you may feel like you're going to explode if you don't say it, tell yourself it's better to explode than to say something unskillful. And of course, the exploding. Part of that has to do with just the mind's tricks. When you're really angry, anger can squeeze your nerves, squeeze your blood vessels. So you feel like you're going to explode. Well, you can breathe through that. When you hold yourself back and not give in to the impulse to say something unskillful, you're going to learn a lot about the mind. Because the part that wants to say it will start complaining. You have to question it. And the more you can question it, the closer you get to the real reason why you wanted to say that to begin with. And you begin to realize that there was nothing good there at all. And you have to remind yourself that when the Buddha talks about goodwill and the different types of merit that you make, there's one sutta where he lists generosity virtue, goodwill, in the body of the sutta. And then at the end of the sutta there's a little poem, and the list gets ch tweaked a little bit. Generosity, virtue, restraint. 
Restraint is an expression of goodwill. We like to think of goodwill as being overcoming boundaries and flowing without limit in all directions, and it does have its unlimited side, ideally. But it also means that you're going to hold yourself back from doing, saying, thinking anything that's harmful. Is it not simply that the mind is naturally good and anything that would come out without restraint can be trusted? The mind has all kinds of potentials, and it can change back and forth more quickly than you can blink an eye. So you have to be careful, you have to be watchful. That's part of goodwill, too. And as I said, you learn about your mind. This principle is going to apply in the meditation as well. This concentration is restraint. You're holding the mind on one object, making up your mind you're not going to go anyplace else. And there will be impulses that want to go someplace else. And you try to soothe them by making the breath comfortable. But then you've got to watch. You've got to protect your concentration. Because the mind is used to looking for happiness in lots of ways. It likes variety. Because the happiness it's been used to is not satisfactory. It satisfies some things, but then there are other parts that are not satisfied. Other parts of the mind. And so you keep looking for different pleasures, and the mind keeps looking for new things to think about. And it's precisely in this tendency of the mind to go out that you've got to restrain. So you're watchful like a spider on a web. Get the breath to fill the whole body, get your awareness to fill the whole body. Think of it as a large web. It's all connected, it's all very sensitive. And you're in one spot. And you're going to watch for thoughts to form. You don't leave the breath, but you're looking in two directions, at the breath and also at the tendency for anything else to come up and disturb it. Because what you'll find as you catch your thoughts more and more quickly is that they begin with a little knot of tension in the breath, at a point where it's hard to say whether it's a physical sensation or a mental sensation. It's on the border between the two. But there will come a point where the mind says, oh, this is a thought about X, either for random reasons or because it has a particular agenda. And once that perception has been slapped on that this is a thought, then it turns into a thought world. And then we go into the thought world, and there you are, becoming. And you learn to see this because you've been exercising restraint, keeping the mind with one object and saying no to everything else that would come through the mind. And it's simply a matter of getting quicker and quicker at sensing these things. So the part of the mind doesn't like the idea of restraint. It feels like it's being hemmed in. But when you narrow your focus like this, you see things a lot more clearly. You stay in what the Buddha calls your ancestral field as a meditator. This is where, where our ancestors all stayed. And by staying here, you get to see anything that would leave the field. And you begin to see why. And so you can take things apart more carefully because you're more precisely focused. And even though there's a narrowing of the range of where the mind is going to go, it opens up a world inside, a world of understanding, seeing all the different tricks the mind plays on itself. So this is one of those cases where a habit you learn outside will be really useful inside, the habit of restraint. 
thinking about the consequences of your actions. After all, you could be sitting here meditating, and your meditation could be just following the mind wherever it wants to go, and then follow and then enjoying where it wants to go, and telling yourself that's meditation. There's no one to punish you. But you have to think, you're punishing yourself. You're wasting a good opportunity. So you want to train the mind in the habits of restraint, reminding yourself that this is your protection. Because if the world is offering no shelter, you've got to offer yourself shelter. You've got to offer yourself protection. And this is what restraint does. It keeps you from saying things that you're later going to regret, from doing things you're later going to regret, from spending your meditation time thinking about things that may be fun, entertaining, but that you're later going to regret. Because if anything, the events of the past couple months have taught us is that you can't be heedless. Things can fall apart very easily. And so when the world is offering no shelter, what shelter do you have? You've got the shelter of your own good actions and your own ability to say no to unskillful actions. So before you do anything, before you say anything, before you think, ask yourself, what are the consequences going to be? Don't neglect your discernment at any time during the day. When you don't neglect it, it will protect you, reminding you, you say this, it may feel good. You may want to get something off your chest, but when it's off your chest, then it's out in the world, and it can come back at any time. When it comes back, it's not pretty. So you create a better environment for yourself outside, and you develop ta talents and skills that you're going to need as you work on the mind inside. So don't see restraint as an imposition. It's a skill, a skill that offers shelter. When there's no other shelter being offered outside, 